I'd like to call to order this meeting of the Sacramento County Board of Supervisors for Tuesday, March 24th, 2020. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll and establish a quorum? Supervisors Frost? Here. Kennedy? Here. Natoli? Here. Peters? Here. Cerna? Here. You have a quorum. Thank you. This meeting of the Sacramento County Board of Supervisors is cablecast live on Metro Cable 14, the local government affairs channel on the Comcast, Consolidated Communications, and AT&T U-verse cable systems. The meeting is closed captioned and is webcast at sacmetrocable.tv. Today's meeting will be repeated Friday, March 27th at 6 p.m. on Channel 14. This meeting is also broadcast live on KUBU Radio on 96.5 FM. A DVD copy is available for checkout from any local library branch. Members of the audience wishing to address the board may fill out a speaker slip and hand it to staff. When the chair calls your name, please come to the podium. Also, please silence your electronic devices at this time. Great, thank you. Uh, will you please rise and join me in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Um, I do have an announcement to make before I make more general um, announcements. In compliance with directives of the county, state, and centers for disease control and prevention, this meeting will be streamed live and will be closed to the public. Uh, those wishing to view the meeting can do so uh, at the Metro uh, Cable 14, with the Metro Cable 14 uh, address. It's uh, metro14live.satcounty.net. You can also uh, view the meeting uh, through the Board of uh, Supervisors uh, website, which is sccob.satcounty.net. Members of the public are encouraged to participate in the meeting by submitting written comments electronically. Comments submitted in person will be delivered to the Board of Supervisors by staff. Public comments will be accepted until the adjournment of the meeting, distributed to the Board of Supervisors and included in the record. Oh, yes. Uh, you may submit uh, public comments uh, in the following ways. You can do so uh, digitally and remotely by going to bird, I'm sorry, board clerk at satcounty.net. That's B-O-A-R-D clerk, C-L-E-R-K at satcounty.net. You can go at online at S-C-C-O-B at satcounty.net and click make a comment electronically or you can do so in person at 700 H Street in the board, outside of board chambers, where again, our staff are prepared to collect uh, written comments and see that the chair uh, receives them in the order that they are given. And with that, I believe um, it is time to kind of state the obvious. This is not a uh, normal way to uh, conduct uh, our business, but uh, neither has it been the normal way of living for uh, the past uh, several days, if not weeks. Um, these are uh, unprecedented times. It goes without saying that uh, uh, we're all uh, trying to grapple with. And certainly as an essential function of government, this board uh, will continue to function as well as it can uh, to give the public the rightful means to petition their county government for them to see the transparent um, activities that we are elected uh, to provide in terms of serving them. And um, I want to first uh, thank our clerk of the board for uh, all of her um, effort and certainly all of her staff's effort to uh, arrange these meeting, um, uh, this meeting setting the way she has. Uh, for those that perhaps uh, can't see, um, we do have even our staff here in chambers appropriately spaced uh, apart. And again, as I mentioned earlier, we have uh, people stationed outside, again, appropriately spaced and protected to collect uh, public comments to see that we can conduct our business here this morning. Um, one of the things that I never thought um, I would be doing as an elected member of this board uh, is uh, ordering a stay-at-home um, directive as we have uh, done so uh, last week and at the same time of course, the governor of California announced uh, a statewide similar order. Um, it's uh, something that um, I did not um, cherish doing by any means, uh, but at the same time, it is um, uniquely uh, required at this point, given the nature of this health crisis. 
And um, I know that uh, my colleagues um, have all been faced with various challenges over the last few days and the last few weeks, and we will continue to be challenged, quite frankly, and we will continue to do the best job that we can uh, to serve the public here in Sacramento County. I do want to, um, as I did last Thursday with the announcement of the stay-at-home order, I would like to thank some uh, specific uh, members of our county team. First and foremost, I would like to thank our CEO, uh, Mr. Nav Gill, who has been um, uh, very, uh, very busy uh, in recent uh, days and weeks, um, assembling his uh, team to do what I think is a, an admirable job of uh, kind of sequentially getting us to this point. Uh, while at the same time uh, making sure that we don't inadvertently panic uh, the public. So thank you, uh, Mr. CEO, for, for all your effort. You're welcome. I do want to thank uh, Mr. Bruce Wagstaff. Um, he is uh, obviously our deputy executive in charge of countywide services and public health falls, uh, falls under his um, direction. And he too has been uh, instrumental in making sure that uh, we are thoughtful uh, and deliberate in our um, effort to protect the public. Um, certainly, probably the most, the person that's been most busy over the, the past few weeks is uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Peter Bielenson, who serves as our health services uh, director. Um, this board knows uh, just how busy he has been, uh, whether it's been um, hour to hour uh, offering um, new public advice and direction and orders. Uh, relative to our intent to protect the public uh, or his, um, uh, his, uh, his very transparent uh, way of uh, being candid with the public and the media about what we're attempting to do and how we're attempting to do that. So I want to thank Dr. Bielenson. Certainly the signatory to the order um, is our public health officer, Dr. Olivia, Olivia Kassiri, and she too has been uh, working night and day uh, hand in hand with our uh, health services uh, personnel, public health uh, folks in our CEO's office uh, to make sure that, uh, again, we're ver being very methodical in how we, um, how we treat this crisis. So thanks to her. And then um, I also want to thank uh, Kim Nava. She is our public uh, information director here for Sacramento County. And you can imagine she has been extraordinarily busy um, attempting to get uh, out information in timely fashion. Uh, not just as it relates to uh, media interests, but certainly as it relates to informing the public about um, our service, uh, the continuity of our service delivery, um, and certainly um, informing the public about uh, measures to protect their, their health. So thanks to uh, Ms. Nava. And then lastly, um, I would like to thank uh, in their entirety uh, all the public servants of Sacramento County. Uh, as, again, these are extraordinary times that uh, deserve extraordinary uh, attention as, uh, as public servants uh, in local government. Uh, everyone I know is doing everything they possibly can uh, to simultaneously protect themselves, protect their families, but certainly protect the public. And that goes across every single agency and department uh, of, this, of this county. I also um, want to thank uh, my colleagues directly, as I did last Thursday, for um, all of your leadership. Um, this is taking, uh, this is a kind of a, a new um, experience in terms of how we collectively uh, manage this type of crisis. We really haven't had this kind of uh, pandemic in 102 years, if you think about it. Um, and so we're not going to necessarily be perfect at what we're doing, uh, but it's the leadership of folks on this board, certainly the leadership in our um, sister agencies, the elected leadership and executive leadership, administrative leadership in those agencies, whether they be uh, municipal government, uh, school districts, uh, the state of California, and the federal government. Um, I think uh, we're, we're, we're doing our, our very best again to uh, work in a very collaborative fashion to achieve the objective of protecting uh, the public's health. So with that. I propose a standing ovation for our staff. I just think they're working so hard. Sure. And, uh, So with that, those, that concludes my, uh, my opening remarks, given the unique, unique uh, circumstances uh, of the day. Um, I don't know if any uh, other members of the board want to make any uh, uh, opening comments, but they're certainly uh, are free to do so at this point. Any opening comments? No? Okay. All right. And no comments from our CEO? 
On that, th thank you for the comments. Um, really appreciate it. Okay, very good. All right, first item. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were talking about the agenda. I do have some comments on the agenda. Uh, well, okay. Sure. Are, are we at that part now? Well, uh, let me just let you guys know that you have consent matters items 1 through 34, um, and I don't have any notes for you today. Okay. okay. Supervisor Peters. Uh, thank you. I'd like the record to reflect. I'm going to recuse myself on item 3 out of an abundance of caution. And then um, I do have a, a comment on uh, number 25. So uh, you want to set that aside for the moment. And uh, number 8. 25 and 8. So let's start with 8. Item 8 is a contract for the Sacramento International Airport New Aircraft Rescue Firefighting Facility Project. The bids are to be received on April 30th. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I did uh, talk to the executive yesterday about this. I, I have a little bit of concern that uh, airports budget is going to be hit pretty hard um, with all the flights being canceled and it may all work out fine but I just want to make sure that when the bids come in that there is uh, a review of whether uh, it's appropriate to go forward with this because things are changing so fast. We, we will absolutely do that. Thank you. And then um, 25. 25 is a resolution to suspend enforcement of zoning and business license conditions related to the limitation of hours of deliveries of grocery or pharmacy items to grocery, convenience, or similar stores during the local emergency for the novel cor coronavirus disease epidemic, COVID-19. Okay, I just wanted to point out that um, this is something that over the years we've worked very hard on, uh, that, that the trucks that deliver our groceries don't wake up uh, the neighborhoods in the middle of the night, and we uh, had a lot of that 10 years ago. I'm sure Mr. Natoli will remember that. Yes. Um, and it is in use permits, and, and the only reason I bring it up is because it does say in the resolution uh, the ending of their ability to uh, restore more goods to the grocery stores, but it doesn't say that in the staff report, and I just want to make that public note that uh, this um, suspension of the enforcement of the provisions uh, that limit the timing of the deliveries by trucks or other vehicles uh, lasts as long as we're in a state of local emergency. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, if you call item two, please. Did you say item two? Item number two is the authority to execute the artwork loan agreement with Battery Park City Authority for the temporary loan of a county-owned work of art entitled The House Will Not Pass for Any Color But Its Own by Mildred Howard for public uh, exhibition in Battery Park City, New York from April 15th through April uh, February 15th, 2021. Yes. Yeah. I don't know um, who maintains, I assume it's either general services or airports maintains the inventory of public art that's either been... Um, relocated or on a, a temporary retirement. I guess my question is, is that um, how does one know if something's available outside of the artist? Is there some registry that we maintain, Mr. Gill, that uh, for art in public places, that uh, artworks that are retained uh, uh, by the county that we either make it available on temporary loan or a permanent loan. Um, this is going to be shipped clear across the country for a period of a year. I guess it'll come back to us. Uh, is there, again, I, this is the first time I've seen an item like this show up on the agenda. The question is, is that does it make sense uh, in the event that the exhibition is over in New York um, and they want to return it to us? Uh, would it be, make sense to have it on permanent loan or is it something we intend to, to reinstall in some future uh, airport uh, renovation or expansion or modification. Again, I just, I, I'm curious now about, is there a listing that somebody maintains in general services of all the artwork that either is retained in, in, in current use and or, uh, as I said, put, you know, put on a uh, reprieve for a while. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased we're able to do this. If somebody gets a chance to see it, we obviously, we pay through this to the enterprise, the airport enterprise, when we did airport construction, but uh, just has raised a number of questions now, and again, this may be not, this certainly not the time that there's any but urgency it, to this. I I, I'm, I'm willing to support the item. But I can answer those. Um, okay. This is a unique circumstance. The house was placed right by the TSA. Right. Um, I remember. 
and TSA approached us and said that they thought that was a security risk, and that's one of the right. very unique situation that we had to decommission the art piece. Since we ended up buying it, we had it. All our other art pieces are being used for what they're supposed to be. We were approached by New York about opportunity with, the, with artists, so we did agree to do this. Once they're done with it, I, of course, we will have a discussion with them. Do they want to keep it? Do they want to give it back? What do they want to do with that? But I want to assure you that the other art pieces that we have at airport and other places, they're all displayed for the purpose they were. This was a unique situation that we could not fit it anywhere else in our airport. <clears throat> So it's how just they because know we, the way uh, it is, you can't see through it, yeah. so the line of vision is not there. And you can imagine the airport setting, line of vision is extremely important for TSA and the sheriff's uh, deputies. So did we advertise that we have this available for exhibition to other communities? How, how did somebody know about it clear over New Through York? the Arts Commission at that point, we worked through them. And then I think the artist too, she had some contacts back. She's from that part of the world. And we agree that her art piece is beautiful. We have no question right, about right. that. But have other folks be able to see it, so. So did any discussion occur relative to um, a, uh, you know, a permanent loan agreement versus a temporary? I mean, we're gonna ship it clear across the country and then they're gonna ship it back a year from now and we're gonna put it back into storage. So I guess I'm just curious about it, that. I think we'll continue the dialogue with them if they like it, if it works for them. We'll see if we can do it permanent. Yeah. But remember, it's, it's our property too, then it will, be, it will be compensation for us. There's all those details that we got to work through with them if, if they want the piece. Okay, I didn't see there was any compensation in the agreement. It was just they have to No, it's not. I mean, if we were to sell it. Oh, right, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. That they have to insure it and obviously they, right. you know, any, any modifications to it. Okay, um, I guess you'll keep us posted on that. Yep. All right, the other question I had, Madam Chair, was on a, <clears throat> just comment on item 28, if you could please call that. Item 28, authorize the Director of the Department of Transportation to execute the North Vineyard Station Roadway Improvement Implementation Agreement between Hedge 22, LLC, uh, and the County of Sacramento. Okay, I support the agreement. Again, that is consistent, obviously, with a, <clears throat> a couple of other previous actions this board's taken, but what concerned me was on page four, uh, this continual slippage, uh, and now it says that uh, in the th third line on top of the page, the county's currently working on modifications for trigger thresholds included in North Vineyard Station specific plan, which will include flexibility regarding construction improvements. Staff anticipates, and this was written obviously before some of the recent, uh, uh, you know, activity in our community relative to <clears throat> uh, the COVID and so forth, but it anticipates those modifications we brought before the board this summer. We were, we were gonna have this last summer, uh, and I thought it was gonna come, I thought it was scheduled initially in April, so I guess, I don't know if Mr. Hartwig has the information on this, but w the continual slippage on this, you know, we're well into this, and now we anticipate this summer. It doesn't say we're gonna come this summer, and so there's some need, I think, to get this to the board, to have those discussions, because as much as this allows some small development to move forward, there's some triggers out there that were board approved that uh, you know, we need to have a discussion. And we, you know, we, we've been years into this and I recognize uh, transportation staff has done work relative to uh, the, you know, the fee program, which was important. That was done uh, nearly a year ago now. And so I guess, I, I don't know what continues to be the delay here. There has been ongoing conversations with developers, with landowners, with members of this board. And here we now, now looking at the summer. And again, this was written before you know, the recent, uh, you know, um, uh, issues that obviously are gonna impact uh, workflow and, you know, and workload by county staff. And so I, I don't know now why this has taken so long. And so maybe Steve has an answer. Uh, yes, Supervisor Nahole, I can answer that. Um, in fact, the, the whole package of the SCTDF fee uh, and the adjustment to all of the projects that were included in that uh, because of the fact that we procured other money and had been able to build some of the projects and so some of those came off the list. Right. The adjustment to the fee was last summer. That was the first phase of the three phase piece of getting this whole thing adjusted to the point where it helps to, to allow some of this, these projects to move forward. Uh, so that was in June, I believe, of last summer. Correct. Uh, and then uh, late last calendar year came back with the uh, reimbursement and credit uh, policy, which the board approved, and so that was the second phase of the whole package. And the third phase, which we anticipate coming back in July, is the trigger uh, mechanisms, and that's one of the things in the in the the vineyard area that is kind of a problem because things that were uh, felt manageable back before the economic downturn 
uh, turn out to be not so palatable as littler subdivisions try and come in and do individual uh, projects and hitting the trigger of then having to build significant improvements. So uh, the transportation staffs have been working diligently on that. They did the, the other phases. They had to work on those and focus on those and now they're focusing right now on the triggers and we expect to bring something back in July. Okay. And that will be the final phase of getting this whole thing that this refers to adjusted. If I'm correct though uh, that uh, that may entail more than just having a staff report before this board for adoption because it goes to zoning agreements that were put into place and uh, uh, actual maps that were mapped with certain requirements on them and again I don't know I know certainly you and certainly County Council and others have been involved in, in public infrastructure finance Bob Davidson and his folks have been involved in this but um, it may not be settled in July unless you've got a, a new angle that you're taking at this because if, again, you can correct me if I'm mistaken on this, but my understanding was, and that was one of the comp compounding factors that might require actually going back into agreements that were approved 15 years ago, uh, maps that were final and or zoning agreements obviously that were final that rezoned land. And if that's the case, uh, you know, how we're, you know, that could mean that it can be years beyond any time the board would act in July. So I guess I'm, I'm you know, do you have any status update on that? I think you had, well, you had asked about, or you had said that it seems to be taking a long time. Well, part of that is that they have been working on those things where we have to make changes to agreements, where we have to make potential code changes, um, and then how we adjust the triggers to a point where we go away from the trigger system where the next unit built causes the need to build a six lane roadway uh, to paying fair shares by those um, developments as they go along. So there's a different kind of approach and concept to how that's going to be moved forward. And yes, there will need to be changes, but that's what they've been working on, is oh. putting that package together. And it would require changes to certain agreements, conditions, and that would all be um, brought to the board for their consideration. As a, as a full package, you're going to have all those bundled together with every all the landowners and developers? What we, would, what we would tend to bring to the board first is the adjustment from going from triggers to uh, to this fair share, you know, paying the, the piece that they're responsible for. Um, and then as individuals come in and want to move forward, then we would adjust those agreements and bring those to the board. Uh, okay, I, and I don't want to belabor to this consent item this morning, I support this, but I just would say that there's, and, and, and embedded in that is another com is an important conversation. This is why we had the triggers to begin with, is because we got so far behind in the infrastructure builds in those areas, and so how we balance that. But I know even coming out of the recession, we had these conversations several years ago, um, and I just think it's important from the currency of it that we, you know, have that focus because you know we had all this pressure about building homes and constructing uh you know uh, housing for folks and yet i don't want to lose sight of the reason why we put these in in, in, in effect to begin with and so i don't know this is going to be a consent item on the calendar obviously it's going to be a, no, no, a discussion before this no, board as to how we balance no, it's, it. it's not going to be a consent item this has got broad policy issues so when yes. we bring it back important it policy. is going to be very um there's a lot of steps in there that we need to walk everybody through so it's not a consent item that we're bringing back Okay. All right. I'm fine. Thanks. Okay. If not, uh, I do want to, for the record, to note that we are in uh, receipt of one comment for uh, item tw 27. Okay. Entertain a motion on consent. Second. It's been moved by Supervisor Frost, seconded by Supervisor Tolley. Please vote. Unanimous vote and let the record reflect that Supervisor Peters recused from item three uh, due to a potential conflict of interest. Okay. okay. Item 35, adopt urgency ordinance and or resolution relating to temporary moratorium on evictions during emergency. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, take the liberty of uh, starting uh, our deliberation and discussion about this item. Uh, we don't have a traditional staff report, um, first and foremost, but uh, uh, I do want the board and the public to understand that the chair has been working in close consultation with um, county council over the past several days on this uh, item that I brought forward. I also want to make note that, again, for the record, we do, we do have 79 to date, or to, to this hour, we have 79 uh, written comments received, um, I believe, um, on the, the item. and. Um, uh, I know many of you are also on the serve also on the STA board, where I believe we had a matrix of opposed, opposed support and neutral. 
uh, for a recent somewhat controversial item. Um, I took, again, um, the um, liberty of working with our clerk of the board so that her staff is not overburdened with this item or with future items uh, to have to do that necessarily, but we agreed that a, a good um, uh, kind of acceptable means of acknowledging public comment is to at least uh, acknowledge the number of comments that we received. So you're not going to get uh, an opposed, support, neutral uh, qualifier for uh, these types of issues moving forward um, in this environment. Um, so with that, I will, uh, I will start off um, with the reason for uh, this urgency measure. Um, first, I want to make it absolutely clear to my colleagues, to the public and the staff that unlike what we deliberated again at my behest um, last November, uh, which was then uh, an urgency measure on uh, to protect renters from um, eviction in uh, unincorporated Sacramento County. Uh, this is, um, it's a similar action that I'm requesting, but it is for an entirely different uh, reason and purpose. Um, as many other counties and cities across California have done or are in the process of doing, and it's my understanding that even today, uh, other counties uh, like Sacramento County are deliberating uh, the merits of an urgency uh, measure to uh, protect um, residential renters from eviction. Given the threat of the COVID-19 virus, um, that this, this is necessary. This is um, not a uh, measure that is steeped in anything other than protecting uh, the health and well-being of the public. And quite frankly, it's not just about uh, renters either. Um, we, as you know, have uh, issued our own stay-at-home order uh, last Thursday, and the state subsequently did the same later in the day. Uh, it's very difficult for me to uh, reconcile and rationalize uh, how we could, uh, as a local government, uh, issue such an order to stay at home uh, when, in fact, uh, I believe strongly that uh, because people are losing their access to income or they're having it interrupted, that very, in very short order, they will be unable to be able to pay their rents. And as such, I think that there's an immediate threat uh, for an increase, a substantial one, uh, in homelessness here in our community. And certainly that is something that we grapple with in, under ner normal circumstances um, and uh, consumes quite a bit of our time and energy uh, here to, to help those in need and to do it with uh, thoughtfulness in, in mind. Um, but this, these, again, are unusual circumstances. And um, I don't see how we can simultaneously order people to stay home if they um, find themselves in a position where they might uh, become homeless and therefore expose themselves uh, more so to, uh, to the virus. And uh, because of the nature of the virus um, being that uh, many folks are uh, asymptomatic while at the same time shedding the virus, uh, they would pose a, a threat, a public health threat, quite frankly, uh, to uh, others if they're forced into um, uh, environments that are um, uh, filled with more people, say in shelters, or in the worst case scenario, if they find themselves on the street or the riverbank in, in encampments. And so, again, that's why I believe strongly that this is a uh, public health measure. Um, I would um, like to acknowledge, because again, we don't have the opportunity to hear oral testimony from folks that feel passionately on both sides about this today, that I know we are all in receipt of um, those comments, written comments that I mentioned at the outset of this item. Um, and we've heard from uh, renters that um, are stressing the nature of the urgency uh, for, this, um, for this policy. Uh, we have heard from landlords who feel that uh, this would interrupt their uh, access to income. Uh, I've heard from several landlords that are in support of this urgency measure, uh, even though they have income properties, rental income properties, who I think would otherwise, out of the goodness of their hearts, uh, refuse to evict anyone. But again, this is a public health measure, and so um, I don't believe we can just rely on um, and hope for uh, people to uh, act consistently without um, having some enforceability to this. Um, again, this is not unusual. There are other counties and cities across the state that have either adopted it or, or are in the process of considering it. Um, I know that it is an issue that um, 
all of us feel strongly about, and we'll probably um, see just how strongly we feel here in a minute in, in terms of our discussion and del deliberation. But I just wanted to make it clear the reasons why I've brought this forward. Again, uh, working in close conjunction with uh, County Council's office. Um, procedurally, uh, I would like to kind of set the table for how this morning's deliberation on this matter is going to proceed. Um, it is unusual, as you'll note uh, from the board letter and the um, uh, board materials for this item, we are considering uh, both a urgency ordinance, which requires a supermajority four-fifths vote of this board to go into effect immediately if it is the will of the board uh, upon that voting threshold. Um, and we're also considering um, a resolution. I want to make it clear, and the resolution, by the way, has identical language. I want to make it clear that we're voting separately on each. Um, my uh, intent is to have us vote first on the urgency uh, measure, of course, uh, following uh, deliberation um, and uh, consideration of, of that uh, item. Um, and then we will uh, move on to the, to the resolution. And by the way, the resolution um, requires a two-thirds simple majority vote of the board. Uh, the, the distinction between the two, put simply, is that an urgency ordinance, uh, or I should just say an ordinance, uh, comes with more force and effect in terms of enforceability than a resolution. I think it's best to consider a resolution a clear expression of the county's intent, desire, um, to some extent hope, um, and a, a, uh, an ordinance, whether it be urgency or a, a, a normal uh, ordinance, um, can, can be enforced. Uh, do we want to necessarily be the enforcement uh, um, body for such things? Absolutely not, just like we don't want to have to enforce uh, stay-at-home orders through our law enforcement. Uh, but again, I think the, uh, this is my opinion, I think the uh, rental uh, ownership uh, community just needs to know um, how, uh, how much we as a board, as a county, find this to be uh, a, a critical public health uh, measure to protect everyone. Um, finally, I, I also want to make it clear before we deliberate first on the urgency ordinance that my intent, uh, depending on the outcome of the vote of the urgency ordinance, um, and I have again consulted um, with uh, county council on this, is that as the board chair, um, if we do not pass an urgency measure, this, this morning I will be calling a special meeting um, in 24 hours of this board. And uh, the purpose of that special meeting uh, will be to consider at that point in time uh, the introduction of a normal ordinance that would do the same, uh, come with the same force and effect as the urgency ordinance, but it would be treated as normal ordinance, meaning that we'd have to have um, an introduction of, of the uh, second, a second reading, I guess it would be, five days from tomorrow, and then it would go into force and effect 30 days from um, from I guess it would be Monday. Of course, we'd have to have uh, a subsequent special meeting early next week to do that. Uh, the purpose of that is going to be, um, it's, it can be compared to a belt suspenders and another belt, uh, if you will. Um, while we wouldn't have the urgency ordinance in place if it fails to pass the corpus um, threshold vote today, uh, we would hopefully have at least a resolution in place by way of a two-thirds majority, by way of a vote this morning, and then the um, uh, rental community would understand that, again, if it's the will of the board to support a normal ordinance by a simple majority um, uh, that would be voted on early next week, that that uh, protection would be in place 30 days from, um, from that vote, meaning uh, it could be uh, May 1st would be the earliest, is my understanding. So with that, um, I certainly want to um, uh, offer the, uh, the mic, the floor to my colleagues. I'm sure there's a lot of uh, interest in uh, addressing this, this matter. Um, and um, uh, before we do that, again, I just want to uh, thank especially County Council's office for uh, her guidance. I know she's been um, buried with a, a number of other uh, pressing matters uh, as of late, but again, uh, because of the nature of this uh, being a uh, critical component part in protecting public health, 
Um, I appreciate her time and energy uh, in her assistance. Supervisor Natoli. <clears throat> yeah, just, just a kind of, kind of process question because obviously as we open this meeting is um, uh, extraordinarily quiet and quiet in the chambers today because of the way we're conducting the meeting under the set set of circumstances. So if I can understand from the clerk, uh, if folks were in the lobby that wished that hadn't submitted comments electronically, uh, they're able to do that this morning, is that correct? Yes, so we're accepting um, electronic public comments you can make directly from the agenda, or they could have emailed me. If they come in person, we have staff outside of the chambers, and they're bringing those in, and you guys are getting your comments in real time. Okay, but they're not able to come to the podium. They're not able correct. to enter the chambers, is that, is that correct? Um, <clears throat> the other question I have then, with the uh, receipt of that information, you've kept a tally. Are you going to share that in a moment of... Oh, I understood you weren't going to go forward, you weren't going to keep a tally, but you've, you did submit information at least yesterday, I guess, to us that kind of gave us the, the total of the comments, some of those being neutral, some of those being in support of what <clears throat> being proposed here this morning, and then some of those being opposed. Did so um, we were doing that, but we stopped because it's hard for us to make that interpretation if someone right. is in support or not. And so at this point, the only thing I can give you is the total amount of comments that were received. Okay. So that's, and, and I heard that going forward. I just didn't know. I know up until yesterday afternoon, you were, you'd give us a, a, a tally of that. So, um, and then we, we don't have a call in um, ability then to the media. I mean, if they called in and voiced concern, you take that telephonically, but there's no, I mean, some boards are allowing for the public to uh, come. We're not set up for uh, the public to call in at this time. Okay. All right. Thanks. That's all I have right now. I, I would just stress the, um, uh, to address what Flo just mentioned in terms of um, some of the email correspondence uh, being difficult for her staff to determine um, position by the, by the composer of the comment. Um, an example of that would be a number of comments we've received, for instance, from folks that are that seem to be supportive of what we're attempting to do with this moratorium on renter evictions, uh, but say it doesn't go far enough, for example. Right. And so, how do you how do you make the determination of which box to <coughs> check? And, and it's just kind of the nature of the beast. So, again, I appreciate um, everything Flo and her staff have have done to manage this, as I know it hasn't uh, hasn't been easy. Supervisor Peters. Thank you. I, I have a couple of comments. I, I wanted to point out, even though you referenced you've been working with county council, that she is not a policy maker, and I don't want the public to think that by her writing this, she is in support or uh, denial of it. Um, my office has looked at the form letters. The, I mean, the comment letters, they appear to be mostly form letters with no reference to their jurisdiction. And this ordinance is in reference to the unincorporated county, uh, not the city of, not from the cities of any of the seven cities in, in our jurisdiction in the county. Um, one of the things I'm concerned about is, is uh, how we help out the small landlords. Um, uh, I, I'm going to read something, an email that I got for, that is typical of a number of communications that I got that says, uh, hello, Susan Peters, I know your heart is in the right place, but who is going to cover my losses when our tenants don't pay us rent for our little two-bedroom duplex that my wife and I bought seven years ago with hopes of supplementing our small retirement income? Obviously, we all have bills that are due no matter what, and how are we supposed to collect the monies owed us in September? How are the tenants going to come up with an additional four months of rent in September? I believe you are creating a larger problem. We are retired and therefore do not qualify for unemployment, which our tenants should qualify for. Where is our safety net? Please consider the impact this temporary eviction ban would have on all landlords. Not all landlords are rich. I am a retired truck driver just trying to keep our bills paid. And uh, in the unincorporated county, there are a lot of duplexes um, that people have purchased to help in the retirement, very similar to this. And that is uh, a reflection on how to help them is not in this uh, ordinance. Um, so uh, additionally, um, this is a, a slightly more complex. I, we don't know what owners 
slash landlords loan covenants are. The uh, financing has really changed over the last 20 years where um, something like where this where you would waive rent, um, it has to be approved by the lender. And if you don't get approval by the lender, which by the way takes a long time, um, they could be in violation of their loan covenants, which could then cause a property to go into foreclosure. And that would be a disaster to have foreclosures all over the unincorporated county. So I'd, I'd like to know what can be done for the small landlords and what we could do about um, investigating uh, loan covenants and, and how they might be affected by um, an ordinance like this. Was that a question for me? I'm sorry, I didn't. No, no. Okay. That was a question for the chair. Okay. Do you want me to respond as you present your questions? I think you can do it afterwards. I, th I think Supervisor Frost is next. Is what I'm saying. Okay. Okay. So. First, I want to start by saying that I. <clears throat> I truly want to help everyone in the county. Um, I'm not sure this ordinance does that. Um, and I, I wanted to just go over a couple of my concerns. Um, number one, right now at this moment in time, people who are facing eviction are not actual vic victims of coronavirus. Um, the process of eviction takes time, and so oftentimes, like if a tenant is late on their rent, for instance, if if someone we we started about a week ago with um, our stay-at-home policy, there are a lot of people who have um, been without income as a result of that, or suffered loss of income, which might impact their rent for April. So if they don't pay their rent on April first. It wouldn't, it, generally, most landlords will have a policy of if your rent is, it's due on the 1st and delinquent on the 15th. And so um, it's not until, um, it, it would, I'm, I guess I'll just sim simplify it by saying the eviction process takes anywhere from 45 days to 70 or 90 days. And so, the point I want to make here is not that um, I get there's people suffering, but there are actually landlords out there, some of them small um, pe landlords who are living on their retirement who have not received rent for four months, and so they're financially challenged at this time. Um, this is all happening. Um, you know, we, under the backdrop of an announcement that came out yesterday from FHFA um, um, regarding uh, some relaxation of, uh, you know, or offering uh, mortgage, uh, hold mortgage orders, hardship forbearance. And hardship forbearance, what that is, is kind of like with the student loans where they allow the mortgagor to not pay their payments for anywhere up to maybe three years, and then they can put those, tack those payments onto the back of their loan, payments plus interest onto the back of their loan. The, the challenge is that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac only represent about 42% of the uh, single family uh, uh, guaranteed loans and maybe around 48% of multifamily. So, uh, there are a lot of investors out there that mortgage lenders sell their loans to that are private investors. And so not everyone is protected under, under these um, Fannie and Freddie um, hardship forbearance. I also want um, to say that a lot of people who have rental properties qu qualified for their loan or, um, e either on their owner-occupied home or on their rental property based on the income that comes from um, the rental property. And so point well taken from uh, Supervisor Peters about loan covenants and violation of those loan covenants. I personally think that this is a problem that was caused by government. Government, we're the ones who have asked 
people to stay at home. Um, and this, the, the best solution uh, for this problem is not to pass the burden on to other people or de you know, on to the landlords, but to provide cash for everyone. Uh, tenants, uh, there are um, employees who were sent home or having a hard time making their owner-occupied house payment. Um, and so um, there is right now a federal stimulus bill and the state is talking about stimulus uh, bills. In fact, uh, the Dow Jones is up uh, 1800 this morning because um, there's a lot of optimism that they're going to vote on this stimulus and be able to pass it within the next couple hours. And so I, I feel um, this ordinance, although well intended, is only going to help a very small portion of the problem and it's going to push the problem deeper um, and extend um, hardship to, to others. The, the best way to solve this problem is with the stimulus. Um, they're promising, you know, there's, there's uh, included within the stimulus is cash for people, um, cash for businesses uh, to get people through this time. And so uh, I feel like we, we have time. Uh, it's not, uh, so this is not something we have to do right at this moment. I would like to propose that we table this and give the stimulus bill a chance to pass and see what the options that are coming down, um, see, what our, see what the help that we're going to receive and then we'll have a better idea on how we can help those that were left out and who, who really need our help, um, like the businesses and the commercial side and the small landlords. So my, um, I guess I, I would like to propose that we s sort of continue this or table this until we know uh, what that stimulus is going to look like, that package, and um, what, what help we're getting so that we can um, craft something that meets, better meets the needs of everyone. Supervisor Tully. <clears throat> yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, certainly want to... Uh, um, express uh, appreciation for, I think, the thoughtful comments thus far this morning, and I think the thought that went into what's before us. I think as I've reflected on this, as I'm sure all my colleagues have, and <clears throat> those have spoken, obviously, have ra you know, uh, raised some um, issues, I think, that certainly are relevant to the matter before us. But what's happened over the last three weeks uh, in our great country uh, since March 4th um, and I guess even late February, but certainly in this state, uh, in less than three weeks, we've gone from state of emergency to stay-at-home orders, and we've seen what's uh, transpired as it relates to um, uh, not only, I think, the, the, the anxiety, but uh, in some cases fear, and certainly the um, uh, wave that we're attempting to avoid as it relates to a uh, public health crisis uh, like none other that certainly has occurred in my lifetime anyway and uh, I think the chair referenced it earlier his comments uh, you know the pandemic of <clears throat> the early 1900s and again hopefully we can avoid you know great sickness and in and, and suffering and, and, and deaths by the actions that have been uh, both uh, ordered but as uh, I think uh, advised and I certainly want to extend compliments uh, to what <clears throat> the chair offered and others uh, uh, to our staff, but to people throughout this community who, uh, those who, one, are making the sacrifices, but also um, those that continue to work in various um, uh, pursuits to assure that uh, public health is protected, that uh, uh, medical facilities are, are available, that groceries are on the shelves, and that uh, some of the essential elements of uh, everyday life or um, you know, you know, lifelines for a lot of folks are kept in place and, and uh, as we go forward. And I, I guess that that's part of the reflection here on what's before us is that uh, we've gone from a declaration of emergency earlier this month to now um, uh, where we are today and uh, the numbers continue to climb as we know more about as it relates to testing uh, both uh, regionally and statewide but certainly in our country and throughout the world and um, again, it's serious, and I think we all take it very seriously. And obviously, just 
the way we're conducting our meeting here today is a reflection of uh, not only adherence to good um, uh, advice relative to sanitation and hygiene, but also to protecting uh, ourselves and all those around us, those we care about and those in our community. And I make those comments to kind of as a preface to what uh, you know I see in the ordinance and, uh, and the resolutions before us is that uh, the reflection on very extraordinary times. Uh, I can certainly recall during my service on this board, um, you know, the 9-11, uh, which, you know, hit this nation uh, and caused tremendous uh, death and, and, and uh, destruction, and things got very quiet, and those were extraordinary times. And, you know, this, this county, uh, for its employees and for the ways that we could assist at the local level, again, being certainly, uh, you know, removed geographically, but nonetheless tied as in so many ways to what transpired on that day and the days following and how this country worked to, you know, rebuild not only its economy, but uh, to heal the wounds and, uh, you know, mourn the losses. And I think what we're trying to do here through the orders is to avoid, uh, you know, not only <clears throat> uh, death, but certainly uh, tremendous sickness and in, 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 in all the choices that then come with that. And one only needs it to turn the radio or television on or any other source of information to see how this dominates all the conversation, all the discussion, uh, our daily lives in so many ways. And for those who have been <coughs> ordered to stay home, um, uh, advised to stay home and in order to protect their own health and those <coughs> of them around them and those that they would come in contact with, uh, is going to mean loss of jobs. Uh, we already know that. We know that it's going to mean certainly loss of income. And uh, in the whole uh, matrix of how our community functions is going to be affected. When you see, you know, the pictures uh, that were in the newspapers this week of, you know, of <clears throat> it's unprecedented. Schools are closed, churches are closed, retail establishments are closed. You can't, you can no longer dine out at this point in time. We're now closing public places, even that are outdoors. And uh, that is very eerie, but it's, it's very um, unsettling. And I think it goes to the degree of seriousness. And so what we have before us today, I believe, is a measure that <clears throat> would not waive a tenant's obligations uh, to uh, certainly maintain the contract between them and the landlords. And I, it's certainly the letter that Supervisor Peters wrote. I read, read that one as well. I have it right here highlighted in yellow, the comments that she read. And uh, I take those things to heart because, again, not <clears throat> everyone you know, is a a corporate investment group that owns large multifamily properties. There are a whole range of those, but in the unincorporated area where we have the ability to uh, impact is certainly the lives of folks uh, um, <clears throat> uh, as it relates to the situations that are all uh, unique, but there's certainly there, there, there's a lot of sameness there in the sense that people are being affected uh, in, in, in ways that could make them certainly, um, I think, very vulnerable to you know being uh, homeless, and I think that goes to the essence of what I what I read here is that this is effort, albeit one that may have <laughs> impacts that that are unintended. But I think the intent behind it is to try to address a very serious situation to, to be a part of the solution and recognizing that I think, as Supervisor Frost said, that we anticipate that help is on the way. Well, I guess we'll know what that looks like, but it's going to still take you know, some time for that to all settle out, and I assume there'll be assistance uh, through up and down the chain for, every, from, for airlines, for uh, the hospitality industry, for property owners, for business owners, big and small. Uh, and, and so I know that at different levels, legislatively, folks are looking to do what we can to soften the impacts and yet continue to maintain uh, the whole emphasis on uh, this public health crisis, um, one that, again, could be epic uh, if we don't continue to, I think, take the actions we're taking that have, again, consequences for folks uh, in their uh, housing situation. And we know that here in California, and certainly in this community, I mean, we've spent hours at this uh, dais uh, talking about how we can try to help address what was an existing situation relative to homelessness. And uh, I think the last thing that I would want <coughs> for anybody in this community, certainly to be homeless, but to because of uh, consequences far beyond the control of anybody, um, you know, uh, in, in certainly in this room, but uh, in legislature or in Congress or the level of the president, uh, nobody controls, you know, you know, what diseases enter the, you know, the mainstream of society. On the other hand, we have the ability to intervene, and that's what we're attempting to do, and to hopefully prevent and to, to guard against that. 
And so what I see as being certainly unprecedented times, uh, oftentimes calls for unprecedented actions. I don't think this would be something we'd be considering um, uh, if the this, if this circumstances weren't so dire and weren't so um, consequential. And so uh, I think from the standpoint of what's before us today, uh, yes, it will have impacts. I trust that, uh, as has been said, though, that we'll be able to, mo to hopefully um, moderate those impacts. Uh, and if this is over quickly, as some predict, um, uh, the impacts may be uh, far less for everybody, and that's a good thing. If it gets extended, then we're going to be in a set of circumstances that obviously would challenge, I think, the very metal of this community, but certainly of communities through up and down this state and throughout this nation. And uh, I don't think we know what yet is, 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 is coming our way, uh, but we certainly hope that help is on the way and, and, and relief in lots of different areas. And so um, I, I'm prepared to support what's before us this morning, um, recognizing that obviously if we had a more normal setting, we'd have the ability for folks to come to the, to the podium and, and uh, speak their mind, either in support of or in opposition to or suggesting comments. But I've read what's been presented to us, and I thank those that have taken the time, again, in very, uh, you know, uh, unexpected circumstances to take the time to, to write to us and to express their concerns, to express their support, express their um, opposition. But I think uh, in light of what uh, is before us as a community and certainly as a state and nation, I'm prepared at the local level to support this uh, today. And uh, again, recognizing that, uh, um, you know, we don't know where we're headed with this, but we hope we're going to come out of this, um, you know, sometime soon. In the meantime, I think we need to to offer this level of, of protection for folks. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Supervisor Tully. Uh, with that said, I'm going to uh, um, not cut off conversation by any means, but I, knowing your your position on this, I'm going to make the motion look for a second to adopt the urgency ordinance as is. <clears throat> I would second it. Second. I've got two yeah. seconds on that. Uh, I think Mr. Tully beat you to the punch there, Supervisor Kennedy. Um, so um, we'll vote here in a minute, uh, but I want to make sure, because my colleagues deserve it, to if they ask me a question, if they have concerns expressed my way, I want to be able to respond. Um, Supervisor Peters a moment ago asked about, um, uh, she expressed concerns about both, uh, if, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the loan covenants and also uh, she read uh, written uh, testimony from a constituent who has expressed concerns because of their scale. They're a small uh, rental income property owner, and they've, I think, done exactly what we would uh, expect to do if we were in their shoes, express concern about their circumstance in this. And I want to be clear, this is not uh, proposed to spite any particular um, uh, component uh, part of the the population that has rental income in fact I had uh, some very productive conversations with supervisor and totally leading up to this uh, this morning's vote uh, he was the one supervisor that uh, I can talk to um, given the Brown Act and uh, to his credit he challenged me to think very carefully about this um, and he challenged me to think very carefully about it with regard to smaller um, rental income property owners. And um, my reply to him is that, um, again, um, it's redundant, but I reiterate, this is not about making value judgments between the types of rental income property owners or the types of renters. This is, at its essence, a public health measure. Uh, some on this dais may not believe the scale of the threat. Um, that is I, not true. Excuse me, I have the floor. Go ahead, but don't that, don't make my remarks into something they aren't. I don't, did I just say your remarks? I said at this dais. Maybe I'm replying to her, okay? Thank you. I have the floor. Okay? Supervisor Frost, since you brought it up, just mentioned that she didn't believe, you know, kind of the, the need to, to stay at home, and it was a government-inspired I didn't problem. say that. I did not say that. Fine. I, I, I believe the threat. And you only need to see what's happening in Italy and in Spain. You only need to hear the governor of California every afternoon explain the death toll going up. We went from 20,000 hospital beds to 50,000 beds uh, in terms of our need. So for me, this is, again, a public health measure. 
And so um, with regards to uh, the concerns expressed about the landlords, there's actually been more activity at the federal level before today at the county level here in Sacramento to guard against the impacts for rental income property owners than there have renters. And so that's why I believe it's incumbent upon us to act swiftly. I don't think we can take the time to you know, vet this to be a, you know, a perfect ordinance at this moment because of the nature of the threat. It should be obvious to everyone. Okay, so with that, there's a motion and a second. I understand there's others that want to speak. Susan Peters. Thank you. Um, I have a great deal of sympathy for those who are, may be, um, have, have trouble with their landlord going forward. Um, I would prefer the resolution form of this because it's encouragement to work together and I believe in uh, people's hearts. They want to work with their tenants. I've talked to a number of landlords who said they are talking individually to their tenants who have income problems. And the other thing is as strong, and, and so I believe in the encouragement that would come from passing the resolution. Um, and I think it's pretty clear that the um, financial impacts of this crisis are equal to the health crisis. So I give them equal weight. Supervisor Tully. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I guess I, I would just weigh in. Obviously, we have a matter before us, uh, a motion before us, but that I, I think all of us, uh, however we get to uh, our determination on the motion that's on the floor, uh, you know, certainly take this seriously. Obviously, we um, you know, come from different life experiences and certainly different, um, you know, political philosophies at times. But, I, you know, I know we've worked together. And again, I think the, the commendation for the staff this morning, Mr. Chair, that you made certainly reflects those that we entrust uh, on a hour to hour, minute by minute basis uh, throughout this county to uh, protect the public in times of crisis or in times of more normal uh, activities. And, and uh, again, whatever vote we have here this morning again i certainly uh, i just want to make it clear i i don't question um you know people's belief about how serious this is and i don't think that was your intent uh in your comments mr chair i just i, I would just say that i think we are concerned we, we we may come at this differently and see it differently uh but in, in in my view as i stated earlier it is a uh epic public health crisis and uh, and that's why i'm prepared to support the ordinance thanks thank you supervisor frost I just want to clarify, I, I do believe that you know, these are unprecedented times. I care about tenants and I also care about landlords and small business um, folks. Uh, I believe that um, this is not anyone's fault and that it's caused by government. Government asked people to go home. So government should bear the weight of it. It shouldn't be passed on to the small uh, landlords and um, to those who are also suffering under the weight of all this. Thank you. Supervisor Kennedy. Thank you, Chair. I'll try to stay within my taped area and reach the <laughs> microphone. Uh, you know, typically I don't, you know, make comments when things that I'm thinking have already been stated. But this, as we've all stated, this is these are extraordinary times. Um, and I will weigh in, first of all, Supervisor Natoli, thank you for your comments. I think you were spot on. Um, uh, because of the extraordinary circumstances that we're in, I think that it is incumbent upon us to look upon those and, and help those that are the most vulnerable. And uh, I believe that this measure does that. Uh, I am completely sympathetic to the comments that Supervisor Peters made. Uh, particularly reading the statement that was made by the landlord. Uh, but I do believe there are protections in place, far more uh, protections in place for uh, property owners than there are for renters. Uh, so um, I think it is our responsibility to take care of those who are the most vulnerable in these times in particular. And I think that this measure does that, thus my support. Okay, thank you. Uh, no one else has uh, chimed in to speak, so I'm going to go ahead and call the question. Please vote.
And the motion fails. Okay. So as I mentioned uh, before at the outset of the item, uh, we, there's two votes associated with uh, the agenda item. One is a vote on the urgency ordinance uh, requiring a four-fifth supermajority vote uh, of the board, which just failed, um, three to two. Uh, we will now uh, consider the uh, resolution, uh, which again has identical language in it. And I don't know if anyone wants to speak to the resolution. Again, it's uh, a different um, legislative uh, vehicle than the ordinance, but it uh, essentially has the same language. If, if not, I will move the item. I have a comment. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Uh, first, uh, Supervisor Natoli. Just a question, and actually pertaining to the previous. Can you clear the screen so we can see what's going on? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. Uh, just it, it, uh, pertaining to the previous matter as well, so this is for a question for council. So in the resolution as well as in the um, ordinance, proposed ordinance, there was the, tied it to the governor's order. Um, again, is, is there any distinction between that and the local order? Our local health officer had the ability, and actually we, we issued the stay-at-home order hours before the governor you know, put his more blanket um, order in effect. The declaration of emergency obviously um, preceded ours. Uh, so I guess I'm, I'm curious, Lisa, how that, the mechanics of, um, of any of, uh, of the two, but certainly uh, how that works. And so would we be wiser to tie it to our local ordinance where we actually control that state uh, versus the uh, declaration of emergency? Or we, uh, but we tied it to the order, not to the declaration. So if you could yeah, just. Sure. Actually, the best um, course of action is to tie it to the governor's executive order N28-20, which gives express authority um, related to reviction moratorium. Um, the public health um, order that Sacramento County issued and that the government governor issued, and I think it was order number 30, but I can't remember, doesn't address specifically this issue. So the way that the resolution reads ties it to the appropriate um, executive action. All right, very good, thank you, that's all I have. Okay, any other questions? Uh, Supervisor Frost. So uh, I just want to say that I'm I'm not going to support um, this. Um, I you know I think if it was stated more broadly, if it was encouragement for um, le for tenants to do the best they can and communicate with the landlords and for landlords to reach out to tenants and give them help wherever they can. I know I know a lot of people who are landlords who have already cut their rent rents in half um, just in view of this extraordinary situation. I reached out to my tenant um, t to see if they were okay and if I was prepared to waive their rents if they had lost their income and just give them a month's rent. Um, so I know a lot of landlords that are already going out of their way to help people um, encouraging the guarantors to to offer forbearance and to to create uh, some some um, resources or some you know a little bit of uh, relaxed give give the landlords time on their loans um, by giving them um, by suspending their mortgage payments for a period of time so uh, I think if it was stated more broadly I would I would support it but um, it's it's not um, if we're going to make that recommendation I'd like to, to see it more broadly stated so that um, we're helping everyone understand their part in in all of it any other questions or comments uh, we have a motion and a second on the floor to adopt the uh, resolution okay please vote And the motion passes with Supervisor Frost voting no. Okay, and again, for the public's benefit, uh, the action we just took required a two-thirds vote. So obviously, uh, we have the necessary votes to adopt the resolution, uh, which is uh, in effect win, Lisa. I think it's as actually a simple majority. You keep saying two-thirds. Oh, I'm sorry, a simple majority. <laughs> yeah, um, a resolution is effective immediately. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so as I stated uh, at the outset of this, um, I prefaced, uh, prefaced it with, um, again, um, kind of a belt on top of belt and uh, suspenders here. 
Um, I am uh, going to be uh, calling for a special meeting tomorrow, um, and I have authority to do so as the presiding officer of the board under government code section 54956 to call that special meeting. Uh, the purpose of that meeting will be to essentially set in motion uh, the consideration and, uh, and uh, cons you know, the consideration and hopeful adoption of a regular, I'll just call it a regular ordinance uh, under the regular process for adopting an ordinance outside of urgency measures so that that uh, ordinance could be in effect uh, as early as May 1st, given all the reading, second reading uh, activities that this board uh, would have to make. And again, it's only uh, with a uh, simple majority of the board uh, to do that. Um, County Council, do I have that clear? Yes. Okay. And Mr. CEO, do you understand? Yep. I would just add, and I know everybody knows, but the meeting can happen telephonically if desired under the new Brown what? Act. The meeting, any meeting, can happen telephonically under the new waiver of the Brown Act if that's the will of the board. Okay. I will and work with a clerk on setting a time and how we're going to do the logistics. I'll start working. I believe the, the code and section requires 24 hours. 24 hour right. notice posting. So right. whenever you can post yep. the agenda. Right. That's why I'm going to suggest that it's going to be in the afternoon tomorrow. Um, and again, for the public's uh, benefit, uh, this essentially, uh, if adopted, uh, what's being proposed in terms of a uh, normal ordinance would enact the same protections uh, with a, a simple majority vote of this board, those protections uh, would go into effect um, beginning of May if adopted. And so the only difference here relative to the urgency measure uh, is the time at which point uh, an infor more enforceable measure, uh, an ordinance separate from the resolution that was adopted earlier would be in effect. I think I've explained that to death. All right. Okay. Next item. Okay, for item 36, I need a motion to continue this to May 5th. Uh, this is the Napa Valley subdivision. It was a request for a tentative subdivision map to, cre map to create 14 residential lots, a rezone to convert a um, agricultural 10 zone property to RD5, a community plan amendment, and a design review to determine compliance with the countywide design guidelines. And the environmental document on this was a negative declaration. Move to continue. Second, please vote. Unanimous vote. Okay, um, I do, we still have item 38, which is the appointments from your own ranks, and then we have your nominations, which is item 39. Uh, quick question of the clerk. So I note on the, the agenda it says for 37, this item is continued. Um, the, but, it's a two, but it's a two o'clock item, Yeah, right? the clerk will continue that item at two o'clock. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so we're on to appointments. So item 38 is the appointments from your own ranks to the National Association of Counties. I don't have the materials for that, or do I? Yeah, that, that uh, uh, item lists me as alternate, and I do not wish to be the alternate. Okay. Is there another member? Anyone, anyone else want to serve? What, what I'm, sir, I'm currently about? serving as this board's uh, representative to NACO and the alternate uh, to CSAC. I am happy to um, relinquish my position as a, an alternate on CSAC to any member of the board that wishes to serve in that capacity. This is NACO, though. Oh, yeah. I thought we were yeah. doing it. No, this is NACO. So you're the member, and we just need to find an alternate. Is there another? I can do it if no one else wants to. Okay. okay. Okay, so let's take a motion. Lucerna as member and Frost as alternate. Please vote. Danico. Second. Unanimous vote. Okay, and now for your nominations, that's item 39. Thank you. You are continuing to May 5th, the Carmichael Old Foothill Farms Community Planning Advisory Council, Kasumnas Area Community Planning Advisory Council, Delta Citizens Municipal Advisory Council, In-Home Supportive Services Advisory Committee, Local Child Care Planning and Development Council, North Highlands Foothill Farms Community Planning Advisory Council, and the Sacramento County Youth Commission. Your first item is the Antelope Community Planning Advisory Commission. Uh, council, excuse me, Supervisor Frost. 
Uh, please reappoint Sean Woodland and continue the remaining to May 5. Okay. Cordova Community Planning Advisory Council, Supervisor Peters. Thank you. Nominate Jesse Garcia as the District 3 uh, nominee for the Cordova CPAC. Okay. Disability Advisory Commission, Supervisor Cerna. Chiefs are recommending continuing the item to April 21st. Elk Grove Casumna Cemetery District, <coughs> Supervisor Can you do April 21st, please? We have to do interviews. Okay. Human Services Coordinating Council. Chiefs are recommending continue the item until April 21st. Maternal Child and Adolescent Health Advisory Board. Same. Public Health Advisory Board. Chiefs recommend reappointing uh, Barbara Law and nominating uh, Sanal Patel to the Public Health Advisory Board. Okay, Recreation and Park Commission. Please continue to April 21st. Sacramento County Alcohol and Drug Advisory. Chiefs are recommending continuing the item to April 21st. Sacramento County Mental Health Board. Supervisor Peters. Uh, continue to May 5th, please. And Supervisor Frost. Please continue to May 5th. Sacramento Housing and Redevelopment Commission. Supervisor Kennedy. Continue to May 5th, please. South Sacramento Area Community Planning Advisory Council. Continue to May 5th, please. And I would uh, like to continue uh, my appointment to May 5th. Uh, are you, you mean on the Vineyard Area Community Planning? <coughs> Did you say South Sacramento area? Yeah, on South Sacramento, I only had a nomination for District 2. Uh, I have a continuation for District 1 on my sheet. And tell me again when you wanted to continue May that. 5th. Okay. Uh, and then the Vineyard Area Community Planning Advisory Council, Supervisor Kennedy. Continue May 5th, please. Supervisor Natoli. I just continue for two weeks. Uh, we have an applicant. Please. Okay. And that concludes your nominations. Okay. And now you have your closed session. Any comments from the CEO before we? No, no comments. Okay, any comments by? I do. I, I'd like to know if we could just do closed session here rather than go in a closed room. I mean, if you turn the cameras off and the microphones, and it's a very simple closed session. It should I think, take I think the one minute or less. Having coordinated with the clerk, the thinking is is that uh, just to make sure and not have to second guess whether a mic is on or a camera might be on or a door is open, that we wanted to have people appropriately spaced on the seventh floor. So that's what we will adjourn to. Uh, yes. I, I have one question for council. Um, the chair uh, stated earlier that uh, he only spoke to one member of the board for that item that says nothing to do with the chair. It's just an example. Based upon the governor's relaxation of Brown Act, would, how broadly are we interpreting that? I mean, would that have qualified as a coronavirus issue? In other words, could he have talked to multiple? Right. No, the answer is no to that because the specific order only says that um, the board can receive information and deliberate um, but meaning from a state or local official. So for instance, the county executive could have a conversation with all five of you, um, to give information, you could discuss it amongst yourselves, but you couldn't deliberate or take action, but it doesn't authorize one board member from talking to another. Got it, thank That's you. It's an excellent question though. Yes. <laughs> Supervisor Tully. Yes, just a question for, for Nav. Nav, I think you may have gotten an email yesterday uh, uh, communicated by my office from some calls we're receiving, maybe others are receiving them as well. And uh, my guess is we are not empowered to make any changes, but uh, I want to just put it out there that in light of the IRS and state franchise tax moving the filing deadlines uh, back to July 15th for both the state and federal income tax, it's raised a question with some folks about property tax. Again, talking, going back to some of the conversations about um, you know hardships. And so we've received at least uh, a couple of uh, inquiries, and I trust maybe others have received them as well, as to whether there's any uh, latitude, certainly with the Treasurer Task Letter and the County of Sacramento, um, to uh, you know push back the uh, deadline for payment of the second installment of the uh, uh, 1920 uh, property taxes. And I and and so 
the request so, came up. Yeah, yeah we yeah. have contacted the state since they're, we're in their jurisdiction on that. We're asking the question, are they going to do something for state? We're anticipating to hear from them. Okay, so. because again, I, I think it's all embedded in state law, if, yeah. if memory serves me correct on that one. But uh, in the event, uh, you know, that we get an answer, I think it's something, again, you know, maybe that's why I want to ask in public yeah. because people are watching, so, tuning into this. So, so the, just the feedback, not to belabor, I'm looking yeah. at least to make sure I'm not going too far in. The issue that comes up with the state conversation is a cash flow issue for governments. That if you do not have that, then the continuity of the government, where's that going to go? But that's the conversation we're having with them is that different jurisdictions have different level of cash. So if they were to extend it, our situations, we do not have that much cash on hand. But we have to make a lot of payments, a lot of state stuff that comes in. So it seems a very simple request, but it's complicated in the end that we have to put out a lot of our general assistance other type of money right. to get money back. So that's part of the deliberation of the state. And I think the, the question was, you know, had a little more urgency to it because obviously we're 24th of, of March and April 10th yes. is the uh, filing deadline. In but also to, with them, the uh, conversation to them becomes about penalties and other things that they have embedded correct. in there. So it's a very comprehensive look that they're looking to get back to us. Okay. And we're not the only jurisdiction asking. There's other people asking too. So could you keep board members? I trust you. I, I said well, it up there, but all of us, yeah. I think we're all getting a question. And again, you know, I think people are trying to figure out what their future looks like. So that's yeah, really absolutely. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, before we adjourn, I do want to uh, ask uh, the um, CEO uh, in, its, in this public setting. I've, I've made mention to you, Nav. Uh, personally as recently as early last week, I believe. But um, I know that we're all in receipt of a number of communications from our constituents uh, who own small business, who run small business in the unincorporated county. I would like to uh, work closely with your office uh, in the coming days to explore what uh, measures we might be able to bring back to this board uh, in terms of offering uh, protections to, uh, to small business. And I'm not going to necessarily just limit that direction to you in terms of um, uh, a similar type of um, uh, lease moratorium, commercial lease moratorium. I think that would that might be part of it. Um, but I think we should be kind of looking more broadly at, at whatever's in our control as a county that we can practically implement that protects small business in the unincorporated county. I feel strongly we have an obligation to explore that and bring it back before this board. Okay. And that you should actually talk to the supervisors who represent the unincorporated area if you're going to do that. Which means everyone on this board. Yeah. Yeah. 7,000 compared yeah. to 270,000. Really? Really? You're going to do that? Yeah. No. Well, why not? Yeah, I know. Why not? Uh, Madam Clerk, uh, would you like to read the off-agenda items, please? Okay, yes. So uh, your board, we have four off-agenda comments. Uh, the first one is from Ted Samara, who's the executive director of United Public Employees, and I'm paraphrasing off of the comments. Uh, I write to you with much disappointment, frustration, and downright anger with the lack of compassion and consideration your executive 700H street management is giving to your employees. You have thousands of employees who are being deemed as essential employees because they are government employees and they can be deemed so in an emergency crisis situation as we are in now. However, it is essential to keep employees regardless of age that are suffering from a chronic or underlying condition at work to be possibly exposed to this deadly disease. This is a question. It has been brought to my attention that the county is willing to let them go home to self-quarantine. However, they will have to utilize their accrual balances if that is their choice. You have the means to place them on paid administrative leave during the self-quarantine period. Please direct your executive management team to authorize paid admin leave for all employees, regardless of age, who have an underlying condition to self-quarantine to help avoid getting in contact with this virus, which can jeopardize their lives. Second off agenda comment is from Matthew Bridges. I am writing to ask that in upcoming budget discussions, you sincerely consider promoting real health and safety for all residents by diverting funding from the jail, sheriff, and district attorney, and instead make it a priority to fund our parks, public defenders, health and human services, affordable housing, youth programming, environmental justice, and equitable food systems. Third is from 
Jesse Cockless, who is a constituent, a county board of supervisors to be more proactive in envisioning and funding a Sacramento that promotes the health and safety of all its residents. We demand that this board focus on reducing the jail population and stop giving a blank check to a jail that cannot even provide basic cleaning supplies in the face of an unprecedented uh, public health crisis. COVID-19 will be accelerated by the conditions in our local jails. Do not cut the budget of the Office of the Public Defender. Stop increasing funding to the sheriff. And the final off agenda is from um, Cassie Frederick, Dr. Cassie Frederick. In the face of the current public health and economic crisis, the health of our community now more than ever is depending on increased spending for the Department of Health Services, Public Health, Child, Family, and Adult Services, Human Services, Public Defender, and Regional Parks. The health of our community will not improve with increased spending for law enforcement. Great. That concludes all of our uh, our testimony from uh, folks for off agenda items. Supervisor Tolley. Yeah, um, Mr. Chair, I, um, Nav, you heard the context of some of the comments, but apparently information is out there. I don't know whether it has any basis or not that there's already $2 million in anticipated cuts to the public defender's office, and that's what's in some of the communication. So, again, if there's a budget update, I know you're in early formation, but we are in March, and so I would just say that that's the type of information if you could share with us, because you're going to give us a broad overview within our briefings, but now information's out there, and we're already getting this. I have no context to back up whether yeah. that's accurate or not, so. Now, when we have better context, you can imagine we're trying to figure out what to do with the budget. Uh, it should come as a no surprise to anybody that monitors the county budget. We've been very clear that there's going to be cuts coming. Year two of the JOADA lawsuit's going to be implemented. Our folks are looking at a given stay at home what we're doing what we're going to do with the budget our numbers are out there absolutely we're discussing this with everybody that we have cuts coming but i think um i appreciate the vigor that some people are saying where we should put the cuts but we are very early right. in our deliberations and you got to also imagine with a lot of our staff at home what kind of budget are we going to have coming in yes. so all that's been contemplated when we are at a, at a spot to give you an update absolutely will give you that but there will be numbers flying out there at this point because we are working on the budget okay next time we come in session we, we, i guess we have a special session call now but it's april 7th and so we'll be roughly two months away from budget deliberations and again <clears throat> i know you've briefed us you know generally so if there are you know the magnitude of what's being alluded to here so at least we've got some idea yeah. don i would yeah. not want to put that expectation because whatever we tell you now is going to be subject to change as we get close we will know what to do with it yeah. i give you a number right now these are very raw numbers yeah. Yeah. it happened last year there was departments that had numbers that um, we by the time we got done it wasn't the magnitude it was there yeah. and i think i understand the spirit i understand folks there's a crisis at hand and they want to put their agenda forward no no disrespect to them but i do need a little bit of room to continue the budget i will absolutely keep you guys in the loop when i'm close to saying what to do with this budget okay. i don't even know what budget will look like in june at this point right. given where we are um that's one part of the equation that they're looking at we're looking at the economic impact because if our tax receipts are not coming in if sales tax is down to is down almost everything's down for us so the numbers are going to change and we are working to come up with what is the most deliberate way to a budget when most of our folks sitting at home okay. and what do we bring back to you okay. so that's what i'm looking at but i will bring it back and i do know that you guys are getting phone calls we're getting calls but to tie this to say that because of this COVID issue the redirect budgets thing we are taking those requests but we have to provide essential services at this point. Okay, All right, thanks. Okay, if there's nothing further, we will recess to closed session. This is Alma Munoz, Assistant Clerk for the Sacramento County Clerk of the Board's Office. I am reconvening the March 25th, 2020 Sacramento County Board of Supervisors meeting. Item number 27 will be continued um, to April 7th. The item is the 
2030 general plan annual report for calendar year 2019. And again, this item will be continued to the April 7th, 2020 Board of Supervisors meeting. Thank you.